Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, Fiction versus Fact panel. Uh, welcome. I'm glad everybody's here. I will be introducing the panelists in the order that they are listed in the online. Uh, just simple ground rules. Uh, we're going to do about 45 minutes, and then we're going to open up for questions in the last 15. If you have a question, please drop it in the chat. And if you could be so kind, maybe tell me who the question is for. Um, hopefully you'll get to meet some new authors today and search out their books. If you're already a fan, please find uh, you know, their page and, and leave them a review. So without further ado, I want to introduce Avanti Centrai. She's the author of two books in the Van Ops thriller series from Black Opal Books. Her thrillers combine intrigue, history, mystery, and nonstop action in multiple locations around the world. The Lost Power, the first in the Van Ops series, has been described as the Da Vinci Code meets Tomb Raider. The Lost Power took home the Grand Prize Ribbon Chant Chanticleer International Book Award, a bronze medal at the Wishing Shelf Book Awards, and an honorable mention at the Hollywood Book Festival, and was a number one Barnes and Noble bestseller. Tracy Phillips called book two, Solstice Shadows, a modern day Raiders of the Lost Ark. Solstice, Solstice Shadow became a number one Barnes and Noble Amazon and Amazon bestseller, won a bronze medal at the River Readers Favorite Book Awards and nabbed the grand prize for global thrillers at the Chanticleer International Book Awards. Avanti has another series under submission called The Kiss of the Cobra, the first M2 thriller. I've asked each panelist to give me a fun fact about themselves, make it a little fun. So Avanti was, was once a whitewater raft guide for a few summers, navigating the dangerous rapids of the American River. Mm. Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Next up is mm -hmm. Art Taylor. Art Taylor is the Daniel Day Lewis of the crime fiction world with four <laughs> Agatha Awards three for short stories and one for best debut novel, four McCavity Awards, one that he won last night, three Derringer Awards, two Anthony Awards, one Edgar Award. You're killing us, Art. Mm. Art is a professor of English at George Mason University. His short fiction has appeared in numerous anthologies and magazines such as Ellery Queen and Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazines. He's the author of a novel, On the Road with Del and Louise, and the recent collection of short stories, The Boy Detective and The Summer of 74. Chris Sikorsky at Bolo Books said of The Boy Detective and The Summer of 74, that readers will step away from the collection in awe at the author's ability to perfectly marry plot, character, theme, and length. Art has edited Boucher Khan anthologies twice, Murder on the Oaks in 2015, and this year's California Scheming. Please check that out. Oh, mm -hmm. and Art is up for two Anthony Awards for Best Short Story this year, too. <laughs> Fun fact, I'm sure many of you know this, Art is married to Tara Laskowski. Her first novel, One Night Gone, received a McCavity Award yesterday, an Agatha Award, and she's up for an Anthony this year for Best First Novel. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yes. And we have Harris Orkin next. Harris is Renaissance number one, Renaissance, number, Renaissance man number one on our panel. Sorry for screwing that up. He escaped the boxing ring. He started a career in the world of madmen advertising. While writing plays and screenplays, he embraced fatherhood and his inner geek and decided to script and design numerous video games, emphasis on numerous, that would earn him a WGA and BAFTA nominations. These days, he's writing novels and video games and occasionally casting and directing voiceover for those games. He's the author of two books in the James Flynn Escapade series from Imogen Books. You Only Live Once and Once is, enough. Once is Never Enough. USA Today bestselling author Dan Jolie tells readers to fill a shaker with ice, add equal parts Ian Fleming and Quentin Tarantino, shake, do not stir, garnish with Douglas Adams. Fun fact about Harris, he was a competitive canoe racer in high school. And in 2003, he placed as one of the top 100 Soldier of Fortune 2 players in the world. 
Next up, say hello, Harris. Hey. <laughs> John Galligan. John Galligan is the other Renaissance man on our panel. He's been a newspaper journalist, feature film screenwriter, house painter, au pair, ESL teacher, and a cab driver. John is the author of one standalone novel, Red Sky, Red Dragonfly, inspired by his time in Japan, and two series, The Fly Fishing Mysteries, four books, I'll give you the titles later, and Bad Axe Country novels, two books, from Gall Gallery and Atria books, respectively. Fun fact about John, he spends the equivalent of one month per year standing up to his waist in cold water. He once worked, and I love this one, he once worked as a freezer boy in an Alaskan salmon cannery. And last but not least, Greg Levin. He's the man who will not apologize for his dark humor and satirical thrillers. Greg is a regular contributor at Criminal Element and both HBO and Showtime have optioned his work. He's won two independent publisher book awards, also known as Ippies, and has twice been named a finalist for a National Indie Excellence Book Award. He's the author of The Exit Man, Sick to Death, and In Wolves Clothing. Publishers Weekly and their star reviewed said, this author deserves a wider audience. Midwest Book Review, an immensely satisfying read by an author with a genuine flair for originality and narrative-driven action, unabashedly re recommended. Fun facts about Greg. He lost his sense of smell nearly for five years after banging his head on concrete. Hmm. <laughs> and he can freestyle rap with the best of them, a natural skill he discovered in ninth grade. As for myself, um, I am the author of two series with Winter Goose Publishing, uh, the Roma series and the Company Files. The second book in the Company Files, The Naming Game, is up for an Anthony for Best Original best paperback original. And I also have another series with Level Best Books. Uh, the first one is Dirty Old Town. It's a PI set in Boston, Boston, 1970s. The next book, Symphony Road, will be out in January. And the book following up to the naming game uh, called Diminished Fifth will be out in April. So that'll be the last you'll hear of me on that. Um, I wanted to start off with Avanti and ask her. That's the problem with having a name that begins with A. <laughs> okay. So my question to Avanti is, unlike most thrillers where the protagonist is cavalier about violence, your Maddie is a black belt in Aikido, a nonviolent martial art. How do you go about writing a realistic action scene where the bad guy doesn't get hurt? Hey, who says the bad guy doesn't get hurt? Um, but it's a great question, and I appreciate you asking it, because I think it's important that as thriller authors, we we look at the, um, the culture that we're promoting, right? And so when uh, the Van Ops series begins, Maddie is, she's just a computer app designer working in San Francisco, and she is a black belt Aikido, but she's never been in a fight. So when she and her twin brother start to get chased by Russians, completely thrown out of her element and has no idea how to deal with this violent situation. So in terms of writing some of that, uh, I have um, she and her twin brother join a Marine who has no compunction whatsoever about using force to combat violence. Her twin brother you learns to throw knives, and it provides a, an interesting character arc for Maddie to learn about the difference between force and violence and uh, how she wants to approach mm. that. Um, if you've ever seen Aikido, when somebody attacks you, you can actually use their energy against them. And so there's a, a couple of times where Maddie's attacked, but is able to use the energy's attacker uh, to um, provide situations where the assailant does indeed uh, uh, get his own. Thank you, that's very, very interesting. My next question is for Art, and this is probably my longest question, and I think probably one of the most, probably the most personal. Um, oh. Okay. So the way I phrased the question was, um, and this is in reference to two short stories that Art wrote. 
A Drowning in Snow's Cut, which appeared in Ellery Queen in 2011 and won a Derringer Award for Best Long Story in 2012. And the mm -hmm. sequel, Better Days, also in Ellery Queen 2019, which received the McCavity yesterday, is up for an Anthony Award tonight. Both stories are set in North Carolina, which um, Art knows well, and both are about writers, a father and son. Since we're doing fact and fiction, I wanted to know how much, if at all, are the characters based on you and your dad? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, and I've I've, um, I've talked about this a little before. Drown at Snow's Cut, um, which was was published about ten years ago, was um, it followed this a, a reporter um, and his dad on a boat trip um, from the Crystal Coast of North Carolina, which is uh, the Atlantic Beach area, um, Emerald Isle area. Um, down toward Wrightsville Beach, um, so a little, little further south. Um, and it was actually based on a trip, in, to some degree, that my dad and I took on a boat. We actually got in the water in Atlantic Beach, took a boat down, spent the night uh, down in the Wrightsville Beach area, and, and came back. And it was a fun trip uh, for us. There was no killing on the trip. There was no murder to solve. Um, but but that the, the locale and the trip together, and just thinking about father and son relationships, not that the my dad is not the dad in the story, but thinking about the dynamics of father and son relationships um, helped to, to fuel it as much as the, as the trip did. And it was my dad's favorite story um, of mine. He, he, he was really drawn to it, always talked about it, and, um, and, and he had a personal connection as well. So um, this, uh, a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to revisit those characters again, and same locale um, in terms of, of being set at the North Carolina beach, um, same father and son dynamic that ran it, certainly a different story um, here, um, but it was, it, it's despite the fact that the new story, Better Days, is about a, um, a romantic triangle, the reporter, a woman he likes, and a newcomer into this, this small coastal town, and sort of the, 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 the troubles and jealousy there um, with murder uh, behind it. Um, it's the father-son that comes back to it. Uh, come back to be the center of the story again, at least what I'm, I'm interested in. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's sort of an answer, I guess. There's kind of a, of a, of a, a sad um, um, counterpoint to this. The, story come, the story's title comes from something my dad always said, that there'll be better days ahead. When things are, are bad, he's always like, there'll be a better day coming, there'll be better days ahead. Gotta wait for better days. Um, it, it came out in the May-June issue of Ellery Queen, uh, last year, uh, and my dad died in June. Um, so it, it, he had gotten a copy of it. I sent him a copy when it came out. Um, he read it. We never talked about it. Um, so I, I don't know what his, his thoughts were on the new story um, of, because he died. And so they're not, all, they're not always better days ahead, unfortunately, which comes to the point um, in the, uh, uh, the father-son dynamic there, despite the fact that, that part of their friction drives the story, I hope that his resolution at the end of each story is to their relationship as much as it is resolution to the mystery that, um, that I hope readers respond to because it's, it's what I was working toward. Long answer, I apologize. I'm, I'm taking up too much of the panel, but I appreciate, I appreciate the question. That. That's, that's quite personal, thank you. Um, this is a question for Harris. Yeah. Writing a short story is different from a novel and both are different from screenplays and screenplays and plays, but how has writing video games helped you as a writer? So uh, what sets video games apart from all those other mediums uh, is the interactivity, right? So instead of being a passive viewer or, or player or reader, you're a part of the story and sometimes you can decide on the direction of the story. Now that's somewhat of an illusion because I create all the paths that the player can go down. So I'm still steering the narrative somewhat, but I, you know, part of it is creating the illusion of interactivity and there, and the, you know, and there is some. Um, and so in writing books and film, you can direct the pace and what, you know, you can point your reader or viewer into the direction of what you want them to see. And it's especially important with, with humor because the timing is so important. Um, so it makes it difficult with video games. So I, I've done I've done a lot of video games with comedy. So in games, especially open world games, it's tricky because the player dictates which direction they go. So the story may not, well, you know, you write a, a linear story for a book, 
in a uh, or a film in a video game they may hit the middle of the story and come at the end and you need it to work in any direction any time any way they come into it so it's it's a little bit like three-dimensional chess planning that out um, but what it what it did in terms of helping me in terms of uh, more linear mediums is I'm always thinking about what the player or what the reader is uh, thinking you know um, what they're interested in exploring uh, you know, so I'm always kind of anticipating it. And in a way, as I'm writing it, I'm doing it uh, like uh, do your own adventure. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking of all the options I could take. And then I, you know, I pick the one which seems the strongest. But, I, it, you know, I guess I, it helps me keep in mind that uh, everything is changeable, interchangeable. Nothing is written in stone. And that, um, you know, there are many paths to take. And so... Um, Sometimes that can be a curse, but, you know, sometimes I wish I just could think of one direction and not 15, but, uh, but that's probably how it the most relates to my novel writing, so. Hey, thank you. Uh, this is a question for John. So let's talk about the Bad Axe novels uh, and your research. Tell us about queen culture and human trafficking in the Midwest. All of it seems so convincing that it's hard to believe any of it was fiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, th that all started because I was researching rural crime. I was going to write about an area that I that I like and that I spent a lot of time with in Southwest Wisconsin, and I came across a study that I couldn't ignore. It just blew my mind. It was it was um, an academic study where the researchers were asking uh, law enforcement leaders in small in rural Midwestern communities about sex trafficking, and the law enforcement leaders were 100% male, and their answer to what about sex crime and sex trafficking in your, in your jurisdiction was what we don't have any. So then they asked the exact same questions of rape crisis center workers, women's shelters, emergency room workers, et cetera, who were primarily uh, women. And they got the opposite answer, which is that it's an epidemic. So I couldn't ignore that. And I thought, okay, what happens when you put a someone new you got a new sheriff in town basically and that's a and that's a woman the first woman sheriff in the state of wisconsin and then i wanted to think about well who would that be um and that got me to queen culture um i don't know where you got that term but i like it um there's a queen for everything in rural wisconsin there's an apple queen and a pumpkin queen and a snowflake queen and a dairy queen and a um, I mean, I could go on a sturgeon queen, um, you know, you name it. Um, but, but, but what that gets at is uh, there's a kind of young woman in these communities that is really pretty stunning. She's, she grows up on a farm. She, she can, she can um, handle firearms and tractors and drive any kind of vehicle. She milks cows every morning, goes to school where she's uh, a straight A student, plays in the band, uh, plays on a softball team, rides rodeo. I mean, just these incredible young women. Um, and, you know, a lot of them aspire to be the, the queen of this or that. So um, I created this kind of strong, overachieving uh, farm girl who wants to be the queen and is the queen, and then gave her a backstory where that, uh, that, a, a lack of awareness to the what's what what's maybe wrong with queen culture, the objectification and so forth, that gets shattered, um, and she comes back as a person in law enforcement who has the awareness, and the toughness, um, and the incentive uh, to you know, going back to the study about sex trafficking to see things that have been to see and to face and confront things that have been uh, ignored or not seen before her. Well. So Her name Greg, is Heidi, Heidi Kick. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Greg, you sort of, you, well, you did in Wolf's Clothing also deal with human trafficking. Uh, your other two books deal with mental health issues, but I wanted to ask you about Wolf's Clothing because you you also went very, very dark and I was, and you also describe addiction very well in your, your books. How did you do the, the uh, research for human trafficking in Wolf's Clothing? Well, it was actually, it, came very naturally because my wife had gone, so I was working on a, a new novel, probably about two, three chapters in, completely different novel. My wife went on a uh, humanitarian trip to Cambodia to help build art centers for children um, who were former uh, child sex slaves. I mean, they were, they were victims of child sex trafficking. And it's just fascinating. So she came home and, I, and she's telling me all, all the wonderful things they were doing with the art. 
the center they were building and I was just completely intrigued, but I just had one question in my, in my head. I couldn't get, I couldn't get out. And that was, how do they get there? How do they, how do, we're talking five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year old girls. How do they get out of these brothels? And she told me um, uh, that there are these uh, organizations, there's a big one in America called Operation Underground, uh, Oper Oper Operation Underground Railroad, that they pretend to be, they set up sting operations and they pretend to be um, the worst people in the world so they can cap help capture the worst people in the world. They go in there and they set up these parties and mansions and they have the, uh, they have these pimps bring uh, the young girls to the, and they think they're going to have a party and then they're actually getting busted and it's really harrowing, harrowing work. Uh, it's dangerous physically, obviously, but also really dangerous emotionally. So when she told me that, I was like, I just pushed aside my next, uh, the book I had been working on because I was only a few chapters in. I couldn't get, I, I was like, that's my character. That is my character. So I reached out to the organization. They put me in touch with a guy who I'm friends with to this day. He, we just totally connected. One thing that fascinated, I mean, he, he gave me so much information. I didn't want to ask I didn't want to interview him like this was going to be a biography. So I just asked him some broad information. And when I sent him about half, first half of the book to see what he thought, you know, my kind of getting it, he's like, how much did I tell you about myself? And I said, mm, not that much. He's like, you told my story. Like you, I, you, most of us have problems with drug and alcohol addiction. who are on this crew of men because to help deal with it. We, there's a lot of humor in it because we have to use humor to survive this horrible kind of work. And he was just, he was shocked. And I, I was flattered that I was able to capture this because I just kind of extrapolated based on what he had told me, what, what kind of person would, what would it take to, to do that kind of work? And so it was wonderful. If I had a question, if I was really stuck in like, you know, with the logistics of how, how something would go down at, a, at one of these sting operations, he was a phone call or an email or even a text message away. So a lot of credit to, to him, his name's Rad Barrett. And just that made it super easy, really. And the addiction part was, you know, I've had a, a brother I lost to uh, alcoholism uh, and just, I have a back injury that uh, I, I luckily don't like being on pain medication, but when you have a back injury, you, you do, <laughs> uh, just until the pain's gone. So I can kind of imagine like, what if I didn't have my pain medication when my back was out? So I could try to get like that, like, craving uh feeling so those two things my brother my own experience with the addiction part not that i i don't have i'm not addicted i'm not i'm not in denial um but yeah thanks for that question it was uh i want to give a big shout out to operation underground railroad thank you so this question is for avanti um you've taken readers to mexico morocco e and egypt what was factor fact or made up about your favorite places and your adventures with Maddie? Yeah, so they've been to all kinds of really fun places. I think one of my favorites is a monastery in Myanmar, which is up on top of a mountain crag. And it looks like something out of King Arthur's Legends, this you know, amazing castle-like monastery on top of this place where clouds literally fly around it. And so Maddie, Will, and Bear, to get there, they have to climb 777 stone stairs in the humidity with, you know, wild monkeys around them to get to the top. Uh, once up there, they, they meet, um, you know, a man who uh, gives them some tests that they have to pass. And then once that happens, uh, the bad guys catch on to the fact that they're there and uh, come in with a helicopter, guns blazing. And the heroes manage to escape down a circular stone um, spiral staircase down the center of the mountain. So everything's true except the spiral staircase and the way that we escape. So I think that would be one of my favorite locations and mm. kind of how I mixed facts and fact and fiction there. Oh, thank you. That's excellent. Um, this question is for art and What I had wanted to ask Art was that the title story in The Boy Detective of the Summer of 74 took you 25 years to perfect and release into the world. Yeah. Are you that hard on yourself or why, why so long? 
Yeah, I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm a slow writer, um, and I, I'll admit that. Um, but th that story was, um, you know, talking about, about fact and fiction, um, that story went through some kind of permutations. It started off um, back when I was, uh, Yes, it, it, at one point it was. But um, back in the, you know, when I was growing up in, in North Carolina, there was one point when uh, some neighbors and I, we were, there were, you know, several boys in the neighborhood. It's a very small neighborhood, very small town, Richlands, North Carolina. And, um, and we found a bone in their backyard. And it, it was, I mean, it was a large bone just in the middle of the yard. And at the, at the time I was reading a lot of Encyclopedia Brown. Um, all of a sudden I was like, this is a mystery for us to solve. We will solve it. And, um, and did not, of course. Um, but uh, years later, about 20 years later in the uh, mid nineties, I thought I can write this story. And so I, I wrote it first, my first draft of it, I think is dated about 94, I wanna say. And it was about 3000 words long. I remember sending it at that point to Ellery Queen and Alfred Hitchcock and being disappointed that it, it didn't get accepted. Um, and, uh, and yet, and yet I'm glad it didn't because over the years I was reimagining it in different ways and thinking about not just that, 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 that one story um, about the kids finding a bone, but also of the, the, the larger community about the South generally, you know, I went to grad school, I studied Southern history and literature and politics in a, in a different way, thinking about the culture of the mid 1970s, 74, what was going on at the time. And so loading a lot of that in there, not just as backdrop um, or as setting, but kind of as, as you know, part of the dynamic of the story, this, this kind of a coming of age story of this, this kid who is beginning to learn about the world that he's in, how that world works, um, that invested the story in a different way. So at one point, this 3000 word story was actually part of a, like one strand of a larger novel and then pulled out of that and made this novella, which was about 18, 19,000 words and then cut down to about 11,000. So over that time, it changed in a lot of ways, um, but I'm glad it did. I had to sit with it for a while and kind of understand what it was I was writing about. And, and again, fill in a lot of the, the fact behind this fiction, not just personal fact, but also bigger, bigger facts, if that, if that makes sense. So Harris, um, in your James Flynn series, would you describe it as more parody, satire, dark comedy, or the ultimate unreliable narrator? Well, uh, so for those who don't know, uh, Flynn's series is about a modern day Don Quixote. Yes. So as a mental patient who believes his hospital is the headquarters for Her Majesty's Secret Service, and that he is a international super spy with a license to kill. And it's, it's you know, the hospital's in Pasadena, and he ends up uh, thinking that uh, the, the, uh, that the Secret Service has been taken over by the enemy when, uh, when the uh, HMO buys out the hospital. And he escapes by kidnapping, carjacking a young orderly named Sancho, and together they go off on this adventure, which turns into a real adventure. So it's um, so it's you know like Don Quixote, it's a parody and a satire, right? It's uh, and it has some black comedy in it, and it has the ultimate unreliable narrator. But that's kind of the central theme of it in a way that uh, that we're all kind of unreliable narrators, right? Everyone is an unreliable narrator of their own life. They're all everyone kind of lives within their own delusion. Flynn's may be more extreme than others, but you know when you look at the current political climate and everyone is in their own factual bubble, maybe it's not that extreme, you know, because um, you see people who have beliefs about things that you just cannot even imagine. So that's kind of and, and so for me, this was a way to explore that um, how everyone really is living in their own kind of self delusion and um, and you know in the in the line between what is real and what isn't real. And you know where fact and, where fact and fiction kind of intersect and collide. So that's so I you know so I guess I'm copying. I'm saying it's all of those. Okay. <laughs> so this is a question for John, um, and this is kind of more of a craft question because I thought this was a an interesting observation. So in your fourth fly fisherman novel or mystery, uh, the wind knot, you took two two big leaps. You placed the story in Hemingway's Big Two Hearted River. And you wrote the story in third person and not in first person. Can you tell us why you chose third person? 
I, I, first of all, you, you're asking great questions and I appreciate having a chance to think about them. And my answer to that one is I blame Elmore Leonard and Carl Hyacin because uh, I love both those guys. And, and I was just got jealous of the multiple viewpoints. You know, I, um, I think I got a little, felt a little bored and a little stuck and uh, by the first person viewpoint. Um, you know, there's some really, really uh, great advantages to that viewpoint um, because mm -hmm. you can be absolutely intimate with, you know, backstory and, and with hopes and dreams and interiority and all that kind of stuff, interiority. Um, but you can only go one place at a time with one character. And so I, I think that I just wanted to tell um, a somewhat bigger story. And I, and, um, I like the way that um, when you have multiple viewpoints, you can also have multiple voices. Uh, and you can see the story from different angles. And I think it's a, I think you can create a, a deeper uh, sense of um, conflict and suspense when you have more viewpoints. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's why. Mm. I, by the way, there's no big two-hearted river. That, there is a two-hearted river, two, uh, oh, okay. Hemingway, Hem, which is up in the UP of Michigan, um, which I've fished and kayaked and so forth. Um, he added the big. He added the big. Okay. Yeah. Did not know that. Um, this is more of a real world question. So I assume this is going to be more along the lines of fact. And this question is for Greg. Your exit man was, has been optioned by HBO and Showtime. And I wanted you to explain the optioning process to the audience because I don't think hmm. most people know about that. And could you tell us how, what happened and how that all worked out for you? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I unfortunately can't provide a ton of insight in, as far as like from an author standpoint, what you need to do to have it happen. Because I got an email one day, I hadn't, I didn't query anybody. Um, it just, I got an email from a producer in, in Hollywood saying, are the TV and um, film rights available for your novel, The Exit Man? If so, who do I speak to? And, and then when I, when I came to after fainting, I, I replied that, uh, yes, they're available and I, I'm the one you're going to speak to because, you know, I was indie at the time, actually technically still indie. I, I have an agent now, but, um, I, uh, basically what you, if that does happen to somebody, again, I can't talk about how do you pitch, but make sure you reach out to, if you don't have an agent, uh, get an entertainment lawyer just, or an IP lawyer and just have them, um, you, you know, you get a shopping agreement. That's basically something is you're giving permission to a producer to shop it around. And so I did that. Uh, and two months later, I was shocked. She called and said, uh, I've sold the exit man to HBO. And I still have scars from, from the pinching of myself mm -hmm. because I, I just, I was like, what? And I didn't know what that meant. I thought, Oh my, so am I going to be on like next week? Like, I <laughs> to, what it even meant? I was just so shocked. And then she explained, well, you know, this me, it's a long process and, you know, a lot of times it doesn't get greenlit. But from there, I had my pick of agents on the film and literary side. She's like, here's what you got to do. Uh, and she actually introduced me to somebody at CAA um, who's unfortunately no longer there <laughs> uh, because of the whole shake that we'll get into the whole, the whole CAA thing that happened. But um, I was able to pick like the head of television at the time to be my agent, not because I was any superstar, just because all he had to do was dot the I's and cross the T's on a, on a, on a deal with HBO. So that was really cool. Um, didn't get renewed. Uh, like a, three days before renewal the next year, uh, it didn't get picked back up. And then my, uh, my agent said, well, Showtime's actually interested, which is not very common. Showtime doesn't usually like to pick up HBO's, you know, whatever, cast the size. But uh, yeah, the important thing is just don't sign anything without having either, if you don't have an agent, make sure you have some kind of entertainment or IP lawyer look at this stuff. Um, who, who, you know, one who has a good reputation, don't just, you know, Google and contact the first one. But ideally you want, you're gonna have an agent uh, who's going to be walking you through and helping you through through all this? But yeah, it's thanks for asking because I obviously I love talking about it. It was like the highlight of my minimal career. So I have a question that I wanted to share between Harris and Art. 
Um, and I'm going to start with Harris. So I want Harris to tell us and also tell Art how you reacted when you I found out you were... I'm sorry? Oh, okay. I wanted you to tell us how you reacted when you found out you were going to be a father and how that inspired the creation of James Flynn. And then Art, I want you to tell us how you react when you found out you were going to be a father and how you would react if Dash said he wanted to be a super spy. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with Harris. Okay. So um, didn't directly, uh, you know, I, I wrote James Flynn years later after my son was born. But when, when I was about to become a father, like in around 1990, 89, um, I did freak out a little bit. I was like, not sure I was qualified to be a father or knew how to be a father. And, um, and I wrote a play about my feelings about that as a way to kind of just be, kind of get through them as a catharsis almost. And it was, you know, most of what I write is are comedy. So this was a comedy play, but it was about those real feelings. And it was called Da Da, play, played at the um, uh, American stage in the East Coast and La Jolla Playhouse out on the West Coast. And, uh, and it really, it was about just someone exploring their feelings about being a man and being a father. And so one of the characters in the play was, was James Bond, actually, because um, there's like a scene in it where the main character goes to his school counselor and she asks him what he wants to be when he grows up and he doesn't want to do what his father did, who was an accountant. He says he wants to do what James Bond does because, you know, he drives cool cars and it looks like he has a lot of fun and the counselor thinks he's joking, but really this character kind of is serious. And later James Bond, as a fantasy, shows up and talks to this character and basically lets him know that being James Bond maybe isn't all it's cracked up to be. Because, um, you know, James Bond, you know, as James Bond, he can't ever get close to anyone. He doesn't, no one really cares about him. He doesn't care deeply about anyone else. He keeps a distance because he is afraid of getting emotionally entangled, you know. And so in a way, James Bond is more frightened of getting his heart broken than getting his legs broken. And, um, and so that was, you know, to me, that was like, the moment I thought to myself, oh, maybe I'm growing up. I don't really want to be James Bond. I want to be someone who has human connections. So, um, and so, you know, that was just me working through that, becoming a father. And, and you know, so now my son's 30 and uh, I survived and he turned out okay. So, you know, <laughs> so I guess that's, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. So Art, how did you react when you found out you were going to be a father? And what would you do if your oh, son... Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah, it was. I mean, obviously, it was exciting. I talk about anybody that connects me on social media. You hear a lot about Dash. Um, he's eight, so a very different age from where your son's at, Harris. <laughs> but um, it was, you know, uh, there has been no no greater day in my life than the day that he was born. Um, and uh, it's been a joy to watch him grow up. And he last year, I, tried, I was looking to see if I could get the picture up on the phone, but I, I couldn't find it. He was James Bond last year for Halloween with a white dinner jacket and, and you know, the, the full with a little martini glass that he walked around with. That's and why I asked the question. Yeah. And just before this afternoon, my wife, Tara, was on the panel just before this one. So Dash and I were outside and I was I've been raking leaves up in the driveway. We have kind of a, a not steep, but a, not a steep driveway, raking leaves up for him to ride his scooter through it. Now, bear with me for a second. So what he, he's been doing some is he'll ride the scooter down and then at the end jump off and turn the back of the scooter mm. around, like throwing it up in the air because when he is a spy later, that's the kind of move he'll need <laughs> to take out the bad guys. So he's been practicing this like fight choreography with his scooter. He's already, he's heading that way. He's, he is heading that way. So that was me at eight. When I was eight years old, that was basically me. I would I used to watch T.H.E. Cat and uh, It Takes the Thief, you know, you know, they were like 60 yep. shows. And I would dress all in black. So to watch your son, it doesn't do this. And, and after everyone went to bed, I'd get up at night and I'd, I turned a like a garden rake into like a grappling hook. And I went around the neighborhood pretending to be a cat burglar. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> That's where he's headed. And he's, he'll sneak around the house like he'll sneak around some. And, and like prove how stealthy he is. It is a little unnerving to us, you know, that he's just suddenly there. So. Anyway. Well, 
a little bit of a well, my wife in the in the chat made the photo public if you want to see if you want to see james oh, really? bond oh. dash's james bond she made the photo public on uh in the chat so anyway so sorry no it's okay um so this is a, another shared question this is for avanti and john um you both have written strong women um john created sheriff heidi kick and avanti has maddie and i wanted to know from the both of you how important it was to create uh, strong women and about writing in um, issues that women face today, you know, whether it's sexism, misogyny, or any other social ills, if you can talk about that from your points of view. Sure, who's first? You go. <laughs> you go, okay. Avanti. Um, all right, girls first. So. I think that misogyny and sexism are just one of many different issues that can be written about. Um, as we talked about earlier, the lost power deals with issues of violence and uh, nonviolence in our world. Um, Solstice Shadows deals with perspective and how we can each, you know, how we're all blinded by our own perspectives and how changing our perspective can be almost magical. Um, the third book that's currently under submission is about uh, sexism, um, but I feel like there's a lot of ways to address that just by having strong female characters, for instance, is a subtle way of um, addressing that issue. And I have, um, you know, all kinds of characters uh, you know, not just women characters, right? I've got guys who are struggling with their emotions. Um, I have uh, black characters and gay characters. And so for me, it's all about what um, social topic or theme fits the story. John? Um, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I come to that obviously from a man's point of view. I mean, I haven't, I have uh, had all my life a very intimate view of misogyny. Um, I even know more than women about it in some ways because I've seen what men are like and what the, how they behave. I was an athlete most of my life. Uh, and um, wow. So, I mean, I kind of know what's out there and I sort of look at it from that point of view. Uh, in a book about sex trafficking, it's important for me to recognize how uh, patriarchy facilitates that kind of thing by looking the other way. Uh, I understand who the customers are for that and so forth. So there's, <clears throat> there's that as well. And I also, um, you know, uh, am acutely aware of the kinds of things that women face when they appear in positions of power where they're not used to, where men are not used to seeing them. Um, and the, the constant drip, 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 drip of, you know, undermining opposition, um, backstabbing, uh, obstruction uh, and so forth. So I just, you know, just all, I've just seen and been there for all of that. And so um, for me, uh, obviously not a woman, but writing from a woman's point of view, I have a pretty good idea of what she's facing uh, from my point of view. And it's so, important. I mean, I, I, you know, that's when you put a woman out as a sheriff, you know what she's going to, you know, she's going to run into that for sure. And I wanted to piggyback on that um, and have you share a question with Greg, because you both have created male characters who are flawed, um, self-destructive, but yet in some way are admirable. And this is kind of a fact or fiction question. Are they, were those male characters uh, inspired by people you knew or were they just something you wholly created? Uh. Go ahead, Greg. John, you want to go first since you're, or you, I'll go. Uh, go for it. Uh, I got to think about it a little bit. I didn't, I didn't think about this one. <laughs> um, well, it, yeah, I can't say that I, they're based on anybody in particular. They're kind of an amalgam. Um, it's, I, I've always been drawn to, as a reader, uh, characters who you, you wouldn't want to be caught dead with, but you can't stop rooting for them you know, the low life, the miscreant who still just has some, there's a nobility about them that's, you just, you're just rooting for them, even though you want kind of want to either take them by the, you know, a collar or, or also maybe run away from them. I just, just the whole, you know, like a Dexter or a, a Walter White uh, kind of a, a character where you're, you're, at least start out with noble intentions, but they just, they, they're so flawed 
And who doesn't like to see, who doesn't like love rooting for kind of the underdog, the person who's pretty much destined to just, you know, spiral down and then you kind of see them either rise from the ashes or make really noble attempts to do so. And while perhaps helping others, I just love that kind of character. And uh, yeah, I can't think I really based off anybody, um, one person that I've met second amount. Um, yeah, my answer to that, I realize, goes back to the fun fact, which uh, just sort of went by, and I'm not sure anybody paid attention to it, but spend half equivalent of one month per year standing up to my waist in cold water. <laughs> that, that's all about is that I'm, a, I'm an avid or, or even fanatical fly fisherman. I fly fish for trout uh, anytime I can and everywhere I can. And, and so you guys want to be James Bond when you were a kid. I want to be a trout bomb, you know, uh, which is essentially somebody who does nothing but fish and and so when i when i went to start to create a character like that i blew it i wrote a bad book um and then this happened one time i was out fishing with a friend um it was the end of the year it was cold it was rainy and on the stream we met this guy this old man <clears throat> who was fishing too and we chatted with him a little bit and we invited him to come by our campfire later for a beer and he's and he you know got this sort of hostile look on his face said i i don't drink I said, fine, have, have a nice night. And so we went back and we, we made our campfire and it's freezing cold. We're both sitting around a campfire in lawn chairs drinking a beer and out of the gloom comes this face and it's him. And he says, I think I'll have that beer after all. And he, I get up to get him a beer. He sits down in my lawn chair uh, and we can't get him out of there. Uh, he has that beer, he has another that other beer and he has that other beer and he has that fourth beer. And I'm standing up this whole time. And this guy turns out to be uh, an ex-cop from Milwaukee um, with uh, just full of rage and grief and guilt and all this mm. icky stuff and, 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 you know, unable to perceive that we wanted him to get the hell out of there and go away. And so what that, what that did for me was it helped me understand what a trout bum really was. Um, this guy was, was a trout bum and he was seriously damaged to the point um, that he just needed to escape and to keep on escaping. Um, and so that was finally the breakthrough for me in creating a character who has flaws, who has, who has hurt himself and other people um, and is trying in his mind in his mind he's trying to heal himself um the way i put it is he's crisscrossing the country in an old rv trying to fish himself to death um and it's you know he it, it's both wow. um but that's how that that's how that character came to be and um uh, it's it's sort of a it's sort of like uh, harris uh, telling us what james bond is really all about on the inside not who you mm -hmm. think well it's profoundly real and also very tragic in many ways. Um, so before we go to the questions from the chat, I wanted to um, ask each of you, we could start with Avanti, what's, what, what can we expect from you next? Are you working on something? Uh, do you have a virtual appearance coming up? Something to let us know what's going on in your life while we're still dealing with the pandemic? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually part of Blackbird Riders, and we have a big sale coming up in the end of October to celebrate Halloween. So we have uh, riders from the, the whole spectrum, from cozy to uh, domestic suspense. I write international thrillers. Um, so that's that's a cool thing to be looking forward to. So blackbirdriders.com, um, people can subscribe and circle back towards the end of the month to find a whole host of award-winning stuff for sale. Art, what do you have um, well, Mike, next? Sure. I mean, my collection, uh, The Boy Detective and the Summer of 74, is still relatively new. It came out right, I mean, it was the last event we did before the pandemic hit. So it was the last time we were out in public, really, before, before that. Um, I did have a story come out in Chesapeake Crimes, um, Invitation to Murder. Uh, it's called All Tomorrow's Parties. It was inspired by a Lou Reed song, at least in part. Um, and uh, that just came out a week or so ago. I, I actually don't have the anthology myself. And I edited, as uh, Gabriel mentioned, the, the Boucher kind of anthology, California Scheming. I don't have that to hold up either, but those are so relatively new. That's kind of kind of the next thing for me. I am working on a novella and um, the, uh, 
the novella should be, it's, it's commissioned, um, should be out hopefully by the end of the year if I can, if I can finish it, we'll see where that goes. So not 25 years on this one, I hope. Oh. Harris, do you have anything coming up? Yeah, I'm working, well, uh, the second Flynn book came out in April and uh, the third one is actually with the editor now. So, and I'm outlining the fourth one. So uh, though that probably will be a year away before I get anywhere close to getting that done. So I'm just gonna continue with that, with that series. And uh, I, I, my guess is there aren't very many video game fans is listening to this, but are watching. But uh, if there are any, there's a game I have coming out called Ghost Runner, which is coming out in about two weeks. And then uh, Shadow Warrior 3 is coming out next year, so. How about you, Greg? Are you working I, on anything? I'm working, yeah, I'm working on, uh, I've, so I'm, um, to ask if I have something coming out, I sure hope so. <laughs> I'm on submission right now, just, so I, I just nailed a uh, nail. <laughs> it's a horrible, hopefully not a Freudian. I just get nabbed my agent in uh, landed my agent in, in uh, late January and things are just getting kind of whole. So, I mean, we were right up to the point we're about ready to submit and then uh, wisely held off because of all the COVID stuff. Um, but it's, I believe, I'm not, I don't like saying whether it's out or not right now because uh, I, I don't, I told her I don't really want to know exactly. Uh, but hopefully we'll be getting some great news soon about that book uh, called Into a Corner. And I have, in the time that took me while I was waiting to hear, while I'm waiting to hear back on this book, I, I finished another book and I'm excited about that. First time I'll be writing as a, or sorry, second time writing as a female, from a female perspective, Into a Corner is my first. And I just started a book, which I told myself I was not going to do. I was going to spend time with family and my puppy and just not write. And I sat down and I, I, two or three chapters fell out. So uh, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't stop myself. Hopefully you'll be hearing from me or about me. But how about you, John? Are you working on anything at the moment? Sure, the, the two books that were mentioned earlier in the Bad Axe County and Dead Man yes. Dancing are out. Um, there's a, there's a con I have a contract for a third and a fourth in that series. The third is in production already called Bad Moon Rising. I'm drafting the fourth. The first two got optioned by Skydance for uh, for television, mm -hmm. and um, so that's exciting. And like like Greg says, also there's a lot of unknowns there. And I want to second his uh, point that I would have been completely lost without an entertainment lawyer. Just um, it took it took that 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 TV contract took four months um, to, okay. to negotiate. So. Um, so I see we have like a few questions here that came in from the chat. I think this one Art can handle really quickly. Um, can you tell me where to purchase the Bouchacon anthology? Yep, I already answered in the chat real quick. Okay. And Kim, uh, Kim uh, Keyline, one of the contributors, posted a link to it. So th thanks okay. for that question. Yep. All right. Uh, another question was for authors who have a series, uh, which book would each author recommend for a new reader, best or most challenging? Let's start with you, Avanti. Yeah, for the Van Op series, I would recommend people start with The Lost Power because Solstice Shadows takes off from where The Lost Power ends. So uh, they're both great. The Lost Power read first. And John, which, what would you recommend for the first in your, you have two series? Um, yeah, in the Fly Fishing series, The Nail Knot would be the first one. Uh, and in the Bad X County series, it would be Bad X County. The first one okay. in the series. That's where you get the kind of the origin story of this young woman who becomes a sheriff. And Greg, even though you don't do a series, what would you recommend someone start off to get a taste of your world? Uh, my, my wife were to answer that question. She would say the Exit Man when they got optioned, uh, and I, but I would say, um, show you which of my books I would recommend. My my latest. Uh, I got to. Um, work for 10 weeks in a workshop with Chuck Polinick and he really honed my writing. And so I'm quite proud of uh, In, uh, In Wolves Clothing, the one that got the, the star review from Publishers Weekly. I would, I would, I would start with that one. And then just- How about you, Harris? Um, the first book in the series, You Only Live Once. It's probably the best one. I only have two, so yeah. This one is a little bit more of a rapid fire question because of the way because we're going against the clock. Um, Priscilla had asked, does, does anyone get pushback from family 
about portrayal of the family in fiction. I don't know who wants to feel that mm. one. Does anybody get pushback for how you portray family? I, um, I don't portray I get, family. <laughs> okay. I don't either. Yeah. Yeah, My wife, really? oh, she's, any of you have, like, that's me, isn't it? Like, I, 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 I get that, yeah, I do. That, that, I was just gonna say, somebody's gonna think that you wrote them in. But the disappointment that's, or not, like, how come, how come you didn't base on me? <laughs> I tried to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, I mentioned already that my my uh, that my, that this boat trip with my dad was the inspiration for that story. Um, it was his favorite story, but he did. I did find out that he asked my mom. He said, "He said Art and I get along well, don't we?" Because the father and son in the story are, are a little conflicted. So it did give him a moment of doubt uh, in those ways. But again, it was not based on. Uh, it was not based on him. So uh, so there there's always that suspicion, I guess. Okay, um, someone had asked me what I'm working on, and right now I am um, doing Redline edits for Symphony Road, which is the second in the Shane Cleary series. Um, quick shot, you know, that's what level best. Hopefully that will come out in January. Uh, that's a story about arson, and my PI has three clients and three mysteries, and everybody wants their answer yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, down the road, I will be starting revisions on Diminished Fifth, which is set in off-Broadway, New York, 1953, right after the Rosenbergs were executed. Um, so we'll be dealing with the darker side of the McCarthy um, era. I'll go back to having Roy Cohn, and I'm actually introducing Robert Kennedy in the story. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that he has a long history with the McCarthy committee. Um, we have five minutes left. I saw a question here. Um, it sounds like a craft question. I want to kill a 19th century diplomat who wasn't a nice guy, but really died of a heart attack. Can I use his name in my fictional piece and listing out his various sins or use a fictional character? I'm not sure I really understand that. I think that's I think that's that's historical enough you can kind of do what you want without being worried too much about right. it um, and, and I, I think there's room for in historical some historical fiction to be to take a speculative turn with it if you're not having to adhere too close to history so I think there's room and Priscilla came back and said my family forbids me to mention anyone like them um somebody said do you do, do you base your character on someone um, I'm not seeing any other questions, and I know we're down to four minutes. Um, I don't know what to say. I don't well, I'll say thank you to Gabriel. <laughs> Let's thank Gabriel yes. for doing thank it. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really great thought. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. Um, this was it. good. This was oh, fun. Our tech overlord has showed up. <laughs> great job, you guys. <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, I think you handled all the questions, and that was very entertaining and informative. And I wish you, uh, you Art and Gabriel, good luck tonight on the uh, Thank Anthony's. You. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank everyone, you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Good meeting, yep, everybody. Was, yeah, Thank you. A lot of fun. And good luck. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.